Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Chris Kruger. Chris is the Chief Technical Officer at Miso Robotics, a company that makes some really cool culinary robots. Chris, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. Thanks happy to be here. Happy to have you. Yeah, we, uh, we had a really good talk the other day, and I thought this would be an interesting guy to get on. Uh, so I just appreciate you making the time. Um, seems like a lot of like-mindedness. Uh, always happy to meet another person who likes making interesting things. Big fan of your technical approach at Miso, and so uh, yeah, just excited to get into it. It's definitely a fun place to work. Uh, some of the most interesting products that I've had in a long time. You know, there's real energy being in a startup and being in this space in the robotics space, like we are, and especially being in kind of food tech where there's a lot of wide open space and frankly a lot of uh, desire. To, to automate things. So it's uh, our partners have all been kind of self-selecting themselves and uh, been great to work with. That's awesome. So tell me about the uh, the genesis of Flippy because um, you said you were on Flippy 4 basically last time we talked. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting story that would be fun to kind of hear again. Well, so it's technically we're on Flippy 2, but there's Apologies. been several iterations of Flippy kind of leading up to this. And I joined Miso Robotics about two years ago. Uh, it had been around uh, four, almost five years before I joined. So they actually, you know, learned a lot and tried a lot of different uh, kind of applications, if you will, narrowing in more and more in the food space. Uh, but yeah, Flippy today, Flippy 2, which is deployed at a number of restaurants commercially, uh, actually mostly fries, French fries and fried foods. Uh, but the first version of Flippy was for flipping burgers and uh, was in a mobile cart and did that at a, a number of locations, including at the Dodger uh, Dodger Stadium. Cool. And so, uh, yeah, kind of fun uh genesis of it and it, it's morphed a few times it's now you know stationary it's built into a restaurant uh but you know i think the the founders had some really good learnings from uh some of those early applications and uh, you know with each one it has gotten a little more uh capable and a little more uh cost effective for like looking for at the return on investment more so uh, come to find out you know flipping burgers it didn't really save as much labor as cooking fries and you know unless you're really just in the restaurant doing that you probably not going to figure that out that's interesting how'd you guys kind of crack that code and zero in on that was it just being out in the field and sort of seeing what people wanted and asking questions. Everybody wants to be the fry guy. The fry, fry guy. Well, I think the fry cook is one of the least desirable positions in the restaurant. You know, it's hot and you're around, you know, oil and it can spill on you or burn you. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been to a number of the, the installations and yeah, most folks are not, uh, not sad to see the, the job go away and kind of get redeployed. And they really like the fact that, you know, now there's a, we put a kind of like a plexiglass enclosure around it oh, cool. so that it separates the, the workers from the robot. And mostly that's for speed so they can go, you know, as fast as it can handle uh, the food and really helps with the, the kind of throughput on the product. But there's some other benefits of it, which is, you know, all of the, the hot oil in, and that smell kind of gets contained uh, <laughs> inside there. So, uh, and a lot less beeping noises uh, from timers and whatnot. That's interesting. Do you find the, the plexiglass gets kind of covered in oil over time? And In a couple of places it does. And, you know, 
what's interesting and I think really what separates out like an automation solution from a robotic solution is they're basically doing the same thing. You know, you're sensing, you're planning, you're acting. But the difference is with the robotic arm, we've got seven degrees of freedom on it. It travels on a rail, it's overhead, and we can make adjustments and we can make changes to the motions and, and whatnot. And so, you know, just even recently we visited a store and they were showing us where oil was building up on one of the side plexiglass pieces. And so what we're looking at now is, okay, how can we change the, the motion so that it's not flinging, you know, even bits of, of oil in that direction. Uh, so make it easier for cleanup or maintenance. That's and awesome. you know, we've done like hundreds of those little things over the last year and a half that uh, Flippy's been out in uh, in the live, if you will. And it's it's great to be able to just like tweak and tune things over and over. And it's it's amazing as you kind of look back for us, like we look back at some of our metrics from a year ago, and they're dramatically different now. Because you know, week in and week out, they don't make uh, that big of a difference, but over time, they really add up. That's awesome. Do you usually get to recycle those lessons learned like in your core, you know, code base or is that stuff that's unique for customer deployments or some combination of both? Oh, yeah. No, it's it's common across the, the whole product. Cool. And we have a fair amount of, you know, like uh, configuration built into the device. So it can work with different fryers and different numbers of fryers, different types of food. Uh, things like that. And those are really, you know, we've got it now to the point where those are just config files and nice. the core kind of autonomy, if you will, is figuring out all those edge cases and kind of, you know, one by one, knocking those down and where we find, you know, that there's a lot of correlation and then we'll build in features to kind of manage or maintain, um, you know, certain types of issues that come up. That's awesome. Yeah, that's... yeah. What kind of base robot are you using on Flippy? Um, I, when I looked on your website, it was covered in a shroud, so it was hard to see. Yeah, we put a sleeve on it for food safety. Makes so sense. it's, uh, you know, it really helps, and you can take it off and clean it, and, uh, you know, just good separation there. But um, primarily, we're using Yaskawa arms, nice. um, but uh, we've used uh, other arms in the past, and uh, we look at you know, we're looking at new arms, uh, including the, some stuff from Ally Robotics, which is another startup that's uh, kind of tailoring an arm uh, for the space. That's really cool. I did not know they were doing that. Yeah. What can I ask, like, what differentiates the Ally and the Yaskawa product just in terms of pros and cons and some of the considerations there? I think at a high level, you know, most of the, the arms that are made today are made for an industrial application. And so, you know, the, a lot of them are cast aluminum. They're, they're pretty big and heavy and um, expensive. And so, you know, we've got a little more of a lightweight application, if you will, plus uh, something that's food safe uh, right out of the box is a uh, potential, you know, savings for us. And so, uh, and, and, you know, there's probably a number of different ways to, um, to drive the compute and to drive uh, the actuators on the arms. And so, you know, they're looking at some stuff. I don't know how much they've talked about publicly, so I won't get into too many of the details. But um, primarily, it's just it's really well suited to kind of the work cell that uh, we've developed. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know. I didn't think the sleeve was a bad thing. I mean, you mentioned the cleanup and thinking about it, I'm sure you can bring in a clean one, just pull the old one off and then service it back at the shop. So. That seems to be quite advantageous. I thought that was a clever thing to do. So <laughs> I didn't mean it, you know, in a bad way. But that's no, cool. I mean, all of our products are food safe, right? So they go through regulation and, uh, you know, they get certified that way. Um, and I think, you know, part of it too is, is like what effort goes into maintaining Flippy. And, you know, the less maintenance that Flippy needs, the, the better you know, whether that's an operator at a restaurant or it's a technician that comes out and services it, that's, uh, you know, one of those things that we're really learning now as, um, well, and not only just like the maintenance, but a lot of the restaurants that we're in are 24-7 restaurants. 
And so, you know, they're going all night. Like White Castles tell me they're just as busy at two in the morning as two in the afternoon. <laughs> That's wild. It's, uh, yeah. So they don't want it to really ever be down. Um, and so the more we can do to, to help them with that. But, you know, obviously it needs to be cleaned and uh, there is service to it periodically. So what we can do to minimize that is uh, for the betterment of the the customers. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I can see why you'd go to an industrial arm first with that kind of uh, duty cycle. So Yeah. It um, just kind of takes that whole thing out of the equation for us, you know, get a really high reliable part that we're using that's kind of the critical path to the product. And so it's it's nice to know that it's got uh, that kind of high reliability built in. Yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense if you're running at full tilt 24-7. So Yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan of that, right? If you can remove confounding variables by using stuff you know is going to work, you know, why, why wouldn't you do that? Except maybe cost, but other than that, you know, it's like seems seems like the right way to, to go. Um, yeah, absolutely. Not to hyperfixate on Flippy, but I, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued. Um, is there a, like a maximum number of fryers you can service? Because the rail system, it almost seems like you could have like, I mean, I'm sure there's, you know, there's a saturation issue at a certain point, but where have you found, like, the, the biggest number of fryers you realistically run with one of those things sits at? Yeah, so we, right now, it, it services up to four fryers and or eight bays. Cool. And, you know, it depends a little bit on, and, and there's two configurations. Um, there's one that's more for, like, a three fryer, six bay. And then the the four fryer we also have we call specialty baskets. What's so, a bay in this context? Just so I don't get too lost. Yeah, so the fryers generally like can handle two baskets at one time. Got it. So you can cook two different types of food in a fryer in a single fryer at one time. And those baskets so, are considered to be bays. Yeah. Understood. Cool. Sometimes I don't know how much of this is stuff, you know, like language or vocabulary that we've made up or that's you know coming from the restaurant industry right we're kind of this amalgam of robotics and restaurants at the same time and sometimes we're using robotic terms and sometimes we're using restaurant terms yeah and sometimes we have to kind of make some things up in the middle that just didn't really <laughs> exist before that makes a lot yeah. of sense when i was an undergrad i worked as a line cook in a sushi catering outfit and but i never ran a fryer so i didn't learn a lot of terms to do with that <laughs> I was talking to uh, to a friend of mine in food service, though, and I was mentioning your guys' product, and her and I were breaking down the pricing and, and looking at you know what fry cooks cost now, and what you said is exactly what she said about that job being dangerous and you know people getting you know splashed with oil and burned all the time is is a pretty common thing from at least that conversation, and so I mean it's pretty awesome what you're doing there, and I thought it was neat that we kind of ran the numbers on what a fry cook costs and it's pretty much the same as your robot. I dropped the baskets in the oil, yo, two at a time. I throw a couple in the left and the other in the right. But never double in the kettle, it will color them right. That's really the point is like, hey, we want to show a positive ROI for the restaurants right away. And then there's a lot of intangible benefits to a product like Flippy as well where you know it shows up every day it cooks the food perfectly every time right you can also do things like connect it to your pos system you can profile like the oil usage um and generally i think just that consistency you know you can you could manage a store like maybe when it's slow with one less person than you would without it right and so not only does it kind of take off that top line kind of uh labor savings but it also there's some configurations and some times when you know there's just like less people needed to to run the store so like a lot of the stores struggle to fill you know their labor and so this kind of reduces that burden a bit and they can stay open more yeah that makes a lot of sense and i didn't realize it i mean i guess it it makes sense that you would have done this but i didn't realize it integrated into the pos and probably the whole order system so like you know you don't have to pass a dupe physically the way you i mean obviously it's, it's a robot so that's really cool yeah and i mean so the way it works is right now we have a refrigerator we'll, we'll call it the hopper and it dispenses food and we put two of the main food types in there and usually that's like french fries maybe onion rings 
And then there's there's uh, some bins in the front called auto bins. And then you can put any other uh, food types that are on the menu in there. And with computer vision, we'll recognize what they are and cook them to, you know, their recipe. Um, and then it will dispense everything through the through a hot holding station uh, where it can be served up. That's awesome. So yeah. You say French fries and onion rings, but in the auto bins, does that mean you could have like chicken tenders, fish sticks, like any number of less yeah. common items that still get ordered? Um, is, it sounds like how it works. 15 to 18, I think, is is like the most number of items we've had in a restaurant. So oh, wow. It, it, and, it, and, you then, know, and then you've got like specials that'll come up and they'll say, hey, we're going to cook this new item, you know, fish nuggets or something. And it's like, okay. Um, send us a couple bags. We'll uh, train it on our system, and you know, within a week, you guys will will be in the system. That's awesome. So I'm guessing yeah. you're just going off a base code and then like modifying and calibrating to kind of just weird edge cases. Um, like if you have to rattle the basket a certain way or something like. Oh that. yeah, yeah. So like, you know, even with the computer vision system, it's continually kind of taking pictures whenever it has like an edge case and then it, it throws it into um, kind of like a bucket where the model can be retrained. So the models, you know, over time get kind of better and better, right? Recognizing what a particular item is. And then also like all the motions in the robot, those go into a cache. And so over, you know, the first few days, the cache kind of it's filled up for a, a particular location and you know, kind of rounding out those edge cases, if you will. And, uh, you know, we also, and I think this really kind of goes back to some of my other, uh, experiences like with iRobot or with Motorola where is managing larger fleets is, you know, we gather a lot of data from each of the systems and then we kind of, we're looking for any of those anomalies or error cases, and yeah, building out, you know, kind of corrective actions around each of those. And, um, you know, it was uh, very active for the first few months as <laughs> you know, it's, it went from, you know, like a product that, that works to a product that's hard to break. Nice. And this is yeah. a combination of lab and field data, it sounds like, just from what you're saying. Yeah, we have a great lab. Uh, we're in um you know we're based here in pasadena and uh we've got several flippies there that cook on a daily basis and you know we sometimes we'll see something in the field and we'll replicate it in the lab um yeah if we need to especially as we try and get further and further down the long tail of issues that you'll have with a new product right it's like okay we'll run this one scenario just over and over and over you know it's like okay <laughs> We've got 500 tacos in the lab. Uh, who's hungry? So dumb question, but how do you guys not get fat if you've always got fried food <laughs> coming up in the lab? <laughs> it could be a challenge, yes. Uh, I think the, especially the first few months, like, and especially as you go into some of the new restaurants, right? It's like, oh, what's that smell? It's, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's a new place that uh, they're, they're trying out the food types in. So, yeah, it can be, it can be a little challenging. That's that's awesome. And I mean, I don't know. I, I remember like the, the freshman 15 when I was in school. So I feel like it's probably similar with like I don't know, uh, new interns. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen the um, I haven't seen a trend yet. But uh, yeah, it's definitely you you know, get lots of good smells in the lab. That's awesome. So um, you mentioned tacos like a little bit ago. Do you also have the ability to do those like I, I thought flippy was just a deep frying operation how do, how are you automating taco making um well jack in the box uh actually fries their tacos i don't know if you With guys the have thing. those well yeah. i mean i've been to california <laughs> like we don't have jack in the box yeah. out here but yeah they they do and they have a special basket for them that they put them in um and that's part of that special basket rig that we created for them that's and, awesome uh, yeah, they go through um, a crazy amount of tacos a day. That's that's wild. Yeah. yeah, and then I guess just to drill more into the um, the hopper system. So you mentioned computer vision, knowing what the food is uh, at the hopper level, 
And you said refrigerated, but it almost sounds like you meant frozen. Or do you mean refrigerated and frozen or, or actually refrigerated? It could be either way. Okay, cool. Uh, it could be frozen or or uh, refrigerated. Yeah, some of the food items are fresh and some are frozen. That makes uh, sense. So, yeah. Um, and so the hopper uh, can handle both. Yeah, it's more of a refrigerator than a freezer, but a lot of times frozen items will be in there yeah. until they're, you know, the dispensed. That's amazing that you've built in that versatility. I would imagine um, if you're dealing with refrigerated items, just the flexibility of raw food posed a bit of a challenge. Um, if I'm right, how'd you get around that? Like, what were some of the things you did to sort of take some of the uncertainty out of the equation? I mean, you mentioned vision. i um, sure that's a big part of it. Uh, what, what was some of your journey like there? Yeah, so all of our, first of all, all of our surfaces have to be food safe. So we use a lot of stainless steel um, and, you know, got gaskets and grommets that uh, protect other parts of the system. And uh, the, um, you know, each of the, the items is really, it's, we've got a recipe that comes from the restaurants. They know what the tolerance of the cooking can be for a minimum cook time or a maximum cook time. And so, you know, we make sure that none of the items are, are cooked outside of that. And if they are, then they're discarded or you know, we let the operators know that there's a problem with it. Usually it's more overcooking. We don't really allow undercooking of anything. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, like for liability. Yeah. I guess more what I was talking about is, you know, if I'm cooking a piece of fish, you know, pretty much, every piece of salmon is a little bit different since the animal's not homogenous, you know, from filet to filet all the time. How do you deal with that kind of um, irregularity uh, in, in your input? Yeah. So part of the reason that you know, we've started with fast food is it's kind of a good fit for robotics because a, a quick serve restaurant, as they call it, is really a lot like a mini factory, right? They like having a lot of regularity in the food that's coming in because when you go there, you're expecting kind of a certain, you know, quality, a certain taste, whatnot. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we do train computer vision models with their food. And, you know, sometimes we'll need some extra food or whatnot, or if we're having trouble, the operators do have the option to reclassify food if it was misclassified, but we don't find that happens a lot. Um, especially after the first week or two. And so, um, yeah, it's not really a, a big concern for us that uh, we've got pretty high reliability on the, the vision system. And, you know, we've always got the, the operators as a fallback. That's cool. And well, it almost sounds like from what you're saying that because you're doing, um, you know, fast food, you've got some more um, regularity or homogeneity in your input products too. So maybe right. you don't have like a fillet of fish that looks totally different than last time. You're using like a preformed or, you know, like a similar, you know, to what you had the time before. So that's, that's a good workaround. Um, yeah. I and mean, at this point, you know, we're cooking like hundreds of thousands of baskets of food a month. So, you know, to a degree, right. You, you really get those trends as your, you, you know, your volume goes up, right. You know, maybe and and really even like our first restaurant we went to was a pretty high volume restaurant right and so you know, you're seeing those items many times a day um the models really kind of zero in pretty quick that's awesome yeah and i would imagine it's probably better than a person to be honest just because you get you know so much human error and in, in food service and i mean who amongst us hasn't gone to a mcdonald's and had someone get the order wrong you know and yeah. And, you know, early on, we were kind of looking for some of those things, some of that information from some of the different operators and, you know, like how, how much of the food is overcooked or, you know, what percentage of the food is cooked to spec, you know, and they'd say, well, all of it like, well, okay, well, they're humans. So obviously there's some variability there. And it's like, well, it's not like a thing that they can actually um, measure very well. Right. If this soggy in the bit. You know, it's like unless you've got someone else kind of standing behind them tracking, you know, how well they're cooking each item to spec, right? And so as we were looking at our numbers, you know, and it's like, okay, we're 
we're driving down the overcooking rates. And, you know, now we're like less than 1% overcooking, right? And then it's like, okay, well, I know item overcooked more than, you know, 30 seconds. And, you know, <laughs> we're really dialing in the science. You know, we're sciencing nice. this cooking uh, because, you know, as you're doing a lot of it and as you're doing it with robots, they like that kind of, you know, definitive, this is good, this is bad, right? And so it's been interesting to watch, you know, as we've kind of dialed things in. Um, I think it gives the restaurants a lift that they don't necessarily, you know, they're not really like, I don't know why, like, but it seems like Flippy really does well. Nice. You know, and uh, I think there's a few intangibles like that with the consistency of things that, uh, you know, works well in that environment. That's awesome. And then just to kind of go deeper into the weeds, because that's kind of a fun thing to do with like the 30 uh, 30 second overcook. Like if you get something like that, is that where you throw it to the uh, like a restaurant manager and say, what do you want to do with this? Like you could you could serve them if you want. They're not dangerous, but happy to make the batch again. Or is that um, like you just develop a heuristic with that restaurant or some combination yeah, I mean, of both? We're generally then we'll mark that basket red and you know wait for an operator to pull it out that makes sense. so yeah and then um the other thing is is you know some of the restaurants don't necessarily want all the product to have that same you know like super consistent so one of the things was when we were developing chippy for chipotle um they sent their chef out and they tasted chips and they spent kind of the afternoon in the lab and they're like tasting the chips and they're like, it's too consistent. <laughs> we want, we want a little more variability. You know, we don't want you to like salt and line each chip, right? We want it to kind of be a little more, um, human. So, you know, we had to kind of change some of the ways the algorithms for the salting and liming went to be, you know, more similar to the way their process was, um previously huh and so, yeah you know like some of these things i guess we're you know we're built in kind of to you know the the way the restaurants operate that's almost counterintuitive like that's really interesting so how did you end up doing that just random numbers or like uneven distribution of seasoning it, yeah it's you know, not easy for engineers to say, hey, we want this to be less consistent, you know. It's like, <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's really, it's just, you know, it's a different sequence uh, of those things so that some get a little more, some get a little less. Um, and, uh, you know, it's like when you got enough of that, it's like, okay, that's good. Not too much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So you probably have a like a dial where you can set the consistency at this point, um, at least with Chippy. Yeah, we have a config file, and it's like, you know, if another uh, vendor or another restaurant wanted, you know, more salt or, you know, most of them don't line. I think that's pretty specific to Chipotle, but, uh, yeah, you can kind of dial it in for them. Are they using actual lime juice, or is that like a citric acid powdered step or something in between? No, they're very, uh, you know, kind of like simple ingredients in whole foods and so yeah they use real lime juice that's cool i mean yeah. i use citric acid when i cook sometimes <laughs> for something different i don't know it's kind it of fun certainly would have been easier yeah <laughs> are you using like actual um you know like cut limes or do you have like lime juice at least to to make the the mechatronics easier or i guess it's robotics but yeah i mean what well, we you, Especially when we're in the lab, we're using lime juice. Oh, that's good, at least. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're not <laughs> from an engineering uh, perspective. Yeah. You talk about uh, you know heterogeneous inputs. I mean, I, I feel like a fruit is they're never going to be exactly the same, so it's it's challenging handling problem. Yeah, but I mean, that's the for for me that would be our future. Is you know where are we going and. You know, I think we, we start here with, you know, like you're saying, very consistent inputs. And as we build, you know, more autonomy, more flexibility, more robustness into our general stack, then I would hope that, you know, we also be able to go after different types of cooking tasks, right? And that we have, 
you know, some of the some of the things are reusable. And then, you know, we also develop a lot of tools, similar to tools, you know, like maybe Florian mentioned before for robot operations, right, where it's telling us when we're having failures, right? And it's actually giving our engineers like, hey, here's, you know, a 30 second video of what went wrong. Oh, that's and, awesome. you know, hey, it, it happened at five different locations in the last week. And here's all those videos. So you can look at them and compare that to the logs. And it really helps accelerate our ability to, you know, find and fix those types of problems. And you know, more and more robustness is built into the system, um, then we're ready to to go look at new applications. And, you know, hey, maybe cutting up those uh, avocados is uh, something we can help with, right? Nice. Have you yeah. started approaching problems like that yet, or is that more on the horizon? It's more on the horizon for us. We still, you know, are main focus is with flippy and kind of building out to, to different restaurant chains there um we also have uh cook right coffee which is a the product that we did for panera that monitors their coffee service and it's really more like an iot product um but what it's doing is it tells them how um like how much coffee is left in each of the urns cool. how long it's been there how hot it is Right. And then when they should brew more, which is pretty straightforward, but we also applied an AI scheduler to it to tell them, hey, go brew, you know, a few minutes ahead of time so that the coffee's ready in time. So there's no gap. Nice. But also, as you get through the day and you may not need as much, maybe brew a half an urn or a quarter of an urn so that at the end of the day, you still have coffee because they, they sell coffee as a service but you're not throwing away a bunch of coffee at the end of the day either. And so, you know, they've seen dramatic improvement in kind of the quality at some of those restaurants that, and also it's just a convenience for the folks that work there to not have to think about it. Right. Yeah, and I would imagine a pretty big reduction in waste too, if you're, you know, tapering off use throughout the day. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of applications in, between robotics and AI in food service that are just yet to be tapped. That's awesome. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, it just sounds like you guys are kind of tackling a lot of different, you know, food service problems. And when you mentioned cook, right coffee, I mean, it sounds like, or if I got the name wrong, I apologize, but no, that's right. Oh, cool. Right, perfect. <laughs> and then when you mentioned that, it sounds similar to sort of the monitoring tech you might need to, to monitor oil levels and consumption on flippy that you were describing earlier. So I imagine you got to recycle a lot of code there and, you know, well, it's, we use, uh, Ross or the robot operating system on cool. Flippy and Flippy. Um, but we also used it in cook, right. And part of that was just so that, you know, our software developers are kind of in a more familiar development environment across the products. And, um, you know, we found that the, the bit of extra overhead, really not that, uh, not that much and some of our tools that are more reusable and the concepts are you know easier to kind of go across to different products as well what uh ross variant are you guys using and was that a thing when you came in or was that something you introduced when you got there they were using ross um at least on flippy for sure cool and then um we're still on ross one we're with noetic uh but we've got uh, some parts of the system ported over to ross two and to move there nice that's awesome sometime in the distant future yeah it seems like a lot of people are still running ross one um you know i know in our most recent project we used ross on we were still on ross one just because it's it's a little more stable at the moment but it does seem like a lot of the capabilities in ross two are pretty awesome and interested in kind of seeing that roll out more um you know in a lot of products you know as it as it gets more robust Absolutely. And, you know, I've spent uh, time at iRobot. That was one of the things that uh, I really helped champion there was moving to Ross and um, big believer in open source. And I think, you know, the community itself um, benefits and then the application benefits. So even all the way back to when I was with Motorola, um, I was on the, the Droid program. And, you know, it was really kind of like early days at Droid 
uh, of Android as a, an operating system. And there was still a lot of like hardening to be done of all those different open source components that, you know, go into it's several dozen of them that go into Android. And, you know, I think the lift there is, is once you do it once, then you've got like this kind of common standard library that lots of folks can use to build applications and not just cell phones. And so, you know, I think Android is, is part of the ecosystem along with Linux really has helped kind of a, a large number of applications and, and products. And I think Ross will do, you know, kind of similar for robotics. Yeah. I mean, it has been right. It's, it's been kind of awesome to see. And, um, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a convert. Like I think I told you last time we talked, I, I was pretty bearish on it a few years ago. And, and, you know, I mean, it's, I don't know, I was wrong. <laughs> you know, and I'm willing to say that. And so, um, well, and I say, when I was first at iRobot, we started looking at ROS2 and we really were pushing for it and then, you know, kind of realized that it, it wasn't really that commercial ready. And so, um, you know, we started talking with the Open Robotics Foundation and um, those guys were great. Uh, totally put, really helped us out. And, uh, you know, it was, it was probably a couple year process of getting it and you know we were using it on Roombas and Bravas and so I did you know, not know we were that. really in a strange space. We well we weren't when I got there, but we moved, you know, most of the platforms to, to Ross or would that be like the nine hundred series where you guys switched to Ross where you started doing slam or was it maybe I'm getting the generation No, it was further along. So more like just even their most recent ones like the J seven and, and the I three. Yeah. Oh, cool. I yeah. did not know that. <laughs> that's that's awesome. They had their own. I mean, iRobot's one of the foundational kind of robotics companies, so they had their own kind of internal uh, baseline that they'd used for many years uh, prior to that. And so, you know, there was a lot of skeptics as to why would we move off of this when we already have it working. And it's like because it really reduces, you know, like when a new person comes to the software team, it really reduces that learning curve and it gives you a lot more familiarity when you're talking to other folks about, you know, what the tools or libraries you're using are. Um, and, you know, even then was part of how I met Florian and, and those folks, uh, you know, looking at Ross and looking at kind of the benefits of an ecosystem where you can have multiple players all in the same space and they have kind of their own, you know, separate focus that, you uh, you know, that everyone benefits from. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, if the whole world is working on it of robotics, you know, I mean, I can see it being way easier to have, you know, engineers come in on the team and not have as much of a learning curve. And then also, I mean, I would imagine it probably just gets, you know, made more robust by the collective work of all the different robotics companies and the open source community. And so that's, sure. that's pretty cool. I know one piece of blowback I've gotten with Ross, and I'd be curious to hear how you, you feel this because you appear to be much more of an expert on it than me. I'm more of a hardware guy by training uh, and just what I've been doing lately is um, it seems like um, I've gotten blowback on Ross on some projects just because of efficiency on like a lightweight chipset. So like if you're using um, like an ARM chip or like an STM or something, it seems like Ross loads a lot of extra libraries that, that might make it run not super duper optimized for your hardware. Um, is that a misconception on my part or is that founded? No, absolutely. Or? Okay. Yeah. And, and that was, that was probably the biggest issue that iRobot had with it at first was, wasn't really, there wasn't a lot of focus on what we called constrained uh, compute environments. And so um, a couple of my colleagues, actually did a talk at Roscon, I forget it was the one in Macau, uh, and about that and about BDS. And, and partially because of that, I think they've, um, they've come up with some new implementations or new configurations of like the DDS uh, middleware that were much better uh, suited to, you know, the smaller chipsets. And, you know, I think it's still a bit of an issue and it's 
maybe more of an open source issue, but I think anytime you've got these open source kind of platforms, they do tend to get like extra packages that your particular application may not need, but you know, it's a bit of work to kind of sometimes take them out, right? They they kind of can get in there like barnacles, like makes sense. Oh yeah, we use this one helper function from that library. So it's kind of, you know, it's a little bit of work to take it out, right? Yeah, and if that relies on something that's not in your compute stack, then you're you're a little bit screwed on that particular implementation. But you know, if you've got the luxury of an NVIDIA or like an Intel unit, then you're good. <laughs> so it's yeah. like a lot of the time, it probably just isn't even an issue for the developers. Um, that makes sense. I think they do now, though, at least run you know their their nightly builds on an ARM chipset. And oh, cool. Uh, at least they were for a while. And, you know, on a, on a, at least a semi-constrained platform, obviously you still need a fair amount of compute for most robotic applications, but for sure. Um, yeah. And I think there's other variants too, that are a little more focused on that, right? Like yeah. Ross industrial, if I understand right. I've not really looked into Ross industrial a whole lot. It seems interesting, but I, um, and I imagine with the recent acquisition, like maybe that'll get built out somewhat in, in an interesting way. Um, I'm really curious to see what comes out of that, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it's very interesting for me as well because you know working with Google um, on Android, you know they were really good stewards of the platform. Um, I'm interested to see you know what they're going to do with you know the intrinsic folks, I guess from Google are going to yeah. do with the the Open Robotics team. I think they just made some announcements of. You know, new framework that they're they're championing on um, early days. I didn't I didn't see that yet. That's that's yeah. Interesting. Check it out. I can send it to you later. But uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Sorry. Forget what they they're calling it right now, but um, it's a it's a robotic framework of, of types. Cool. That's that'll be awesome. Now I'm yeah. excited to see where that goes. I mean, obviously Google's got a ton of resources, so. If they throw their weight behind it, I mean, it seems like they did a lot for the Linux community, you know, as well. Um, even you know, as I understand it, before Android, um, just kind of injecting, you know, a lot of capital in that direction, and and you know, helping grow that stuff out, and then recruiting a lot of the Linux dev team into Google. So it's interesting. I mean, it's it's kind of cool to see, you know. Uh, private companies like that playing with the open source community and, and, you know, creating, creating cool stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of big companies that contribute to open source. And I, I think it's, you know, it's kind of a underappreciated side effect. I mean, even Intel contributes a ton to Linux and open source projects, right? Cause they just, you know, they want their chipsets to run well on those packages, but you know, they benefit the packages benefit a lot from them as well. And so, you know, it's like kudos to them, but because we all benefit from it, you know, anyone who considers himself a builder. Yeah, and, that makes a lot know, of sense. Thousands of companies that, you know, use parts of those packages. Um, yeah. I mean, we even worked with Amazon and Amazon was investing a fair amount in Ross for a while, trying to help the ecosystem kind of mature and be ready for, you know, commercial applications. And for them, you know, they're, their side effect was, hey, look, we just want to host the services, you know, like robots <laughs> have data and, you know, we're a good place for that data to go. And so, you know, I think it, there's win-win scenarios out there that, uh, you know, everyone can benefit from. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, um, I, I didn't think about that very much, but yeah, that does make a lot of sense to me. That's, that's interesting. Um, it certainly seems to be the case. Um, so I'm going to pivot a little bit here. Um, what are some of the differences between working somewhere like Motorola versus iRobot versus Miso kind of like culturally, like obviously Motorola is a huge company and has been around for decades and, and Miso is fairly new, but is doing really awesome. Like what, what, are, what's it like, uh, kind of versus one, uh, as opposed to the other? Yeah. I mean, every company is slightly different. Sure. Uh, I think you know, Motorola was, was a great place to work, especially like while I was there, they were really kind of at the heart of 
mobile phones. I mean, they invented the category and they invented so many cool things. You know, they really had that in their heritage. And, um, you know, an iRobot was kind of similar in that, you know, it had that heritage from robotics. And I think, you know, what's, what's cool is in those places, they really kind of know like who they are and what they're doing. And, you know, so th there's a lot of just kind of organizational inertia in the space that they're in. And, you know, innovation is kind of part of that, but, you know, any big company also kind of gets beholden to, you know, the quarter in quarter out. And, you know, as you build out those big profitable businesses, you get lots of competitors. So, you know, you kind of get more risk averse. I assume that, you know, a company like iRobot would be into lots of different robotic applications. They're quite happy being in the robot vacuum and mopping business, you know, <laughs> as they see it. like, you know, they only own 9% of the vacuuming business. Well, okay, they could, you know, just grow and grow, uh, taking over, you know, kind of traditional vacuuming market space for many years. They could wipe um, the floor with their competition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sorry. but, uh, you know, somewhere like Miso, the thing is, is it's really, it's a blue ocean. It's like, there's just so many potential applications. It's really the other side of it, which is, okay, now we have to stay focused enough and make sure that the applications are getting hardened enough that, you know, they can scale. And so, you know, it kind of goes from, you know, it's more on the, the zero to one problem side where, you know, the bigger companies are really more in that, you know, one to a million uh, problem set. And so, you know, there's there's some familiarity, some similarities, um, and then some things you have to translate. You know, you can't necessarily um, just do things like a big company at a startup because, well, big companies are bigger and have more resources to do those. So you end up being able to, mostly because of the size, optimize things for our particular application and for our particular team. And, you know, being smaller, communication and decision-making is much faster. And, you know, finding good partners then allows us to take more risk and move much faster and really kind of cross some of those chasms that big companies really struggle with. That's awesome. It sounds like yeah. you're moving, moving pretty lightning fast and, um, you know, it's just a different problem set. So that's, that's pretty cool to hear that insight. I mean, obviously, you know, being in a startup is kind of like, um, I don't know. I think of it like it's a constrained environment though, you know, like, Hey, we don't have unlimited capital and we may not have all the experts in, in a particular problem set that we need. So then, you know, you really got to get the creative juices going to solve to, you know, those particular problems when they come in. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm sure you see it too, when you're on a, on a project, right. You, you run a, a smaller shop or a smaller crew of folks and projects, right. Yeah. You that's just correct. Have to make it work. Yeah. No, usually our project teams are anywhere from three to 12 people. So we don't really have the luxury of being over resourced there. And I mean, if we don't make it work, I mean, you know, we're off the job and our customer might lose, which is not something we want to happen. So it's, you know, a lot of late nights, um, a lot of Red Bull, you know, a lot of coffee, a lot of, um, you know, just kind of um, grit and, and hard work, but also just kind of clever use of resources and being willing to, to pivot fast. Um, I mean, we're an engineering service, so I feel like communication with the customer is huge because there's a line you're writing where you don't want to over communicate and bug them to the point where, you know, they'd be better off if you weren't there. Cause you're, you know, yapping in their ear every five seconds. But you know, if you need their input, you don't want to be afraid to pick up the phone either. So, you know, just writing that line is, is critical to what we do. Um, yeah, you're right. It's, it's sort of a resource constraint issue and you know, how do you use the little that you got strategically where I've noticed with, you know, some of the bigger companies that we've talked to, um, I don't know if this is accurate or not. I, the biggest company I ever worked for was Joy Global, and they're a Komatsu subsidiary now. 
Um, and then after that, probably SpaceX. And then after that, it was all companies like under 100 people when I was there. And so I guess for me, I, I haven't been exposed to big companies a whole lot. But it seems like, you know, I've noticed um, lately this phenomenon where people are almost more, um, you know, sort of risk adverse in the sense that they'd rather make no decision at all than per be perceived to have made the wrong decision. And so you get this analysis paralysis um, that, I mean, I've, I've kind of noticed from the outside looking in. Um, or, you know, you just, you, people don't hit go or there's delays, you know, on a project that are like a little, you know, I mean, it is what it is, but, and you can understand when you sort of look at the stakeholders position, why they would do that. But, you know, it's different than like if a startup, you know, falls victim to analysis paralysis, they might not exist, you know, in, you know, half a year. <laughs> so, you know, it's, yeah, no, I, I think it's a really, you know, it's a really good point. And I, I like the way you said it, that it's like doing nothing is less risky than, you know, doing something and failing. And so, you know, that's, I think innovation is really kind of struggles with at bigger companies is, yeah, you know, like, even if the, the negative effect to the company isn't that big, the perceived negative effect can be bigger. You know, and so I used to say, hey, don't trade on the brand. And, you know, it's like when we would have dozens of different mobile phones going out each year and I might have two or three of them, you know, there's other managers with other phones, you know, and it's like, oh, man, that, that's not really, you know, a, a good product. It's really not up to the, <laughs> the brand standard, if you will, right? And a younger version of me, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you think of it like, hey, we do all this work to, to build up this brand. You don't want to tear it down with a bad product. Yeah, it makes um, a lot of sense. Yeah, but, you know, so, I mean, I, I guess in that way, you know, startups are a little better off because it's like they don't really have a, much of a reputation to protect. They've got to go kind of get it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I've i been reading the book uh, Build by Tony Fidel lately. I don't know if you've taken a look at that mm -hmm. yet. It's it's pretty good. I've heard it. I haven't read it. How do you like it? I, I like it a lot. I'm only like a little more than halfway through it. Um, I've got to drive to Detroit in a couple of weeks. I'm hoping to finish it on that. If I can convince my uh, uh, colleague who's shadowing me to to listen to half an audio book with me <laughs> in the second <laughs> half at that, <laughs> but we'll see. Um, it, it's pretty good so far. Uh, one of the things he talks about. I mean, Tony Fidel worked on the uh the ipod team and he started nest um and then i guess there were a few other notable projects but i don't want to drone on about tony fidel for too long because you can you can read the book and you know it's all out there but um i thought it was interesting because he's talking about you know even when you're within a large company you're still competing for resources with other product teams and you know it, it might you can conceptualize it like a startup um and i, I had a friend who was at nasa and um, he was a program manager there. He's at Google now, but he um, sort of looks at it. Um, he, he says, in my brain, I'm running a startup, you know, with, with this <laughs> NASA yes. group that I'm working on. And I, I thought that was an interesting way of looking at it. So I don't know to what extent you can really do that at a large company, but it's, it's kind of neat to see that entrepreneurship, I guess, is the buzzword. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that a lot in big companies, you know, like, Hey, you're you. We should think of ourselves as a startup inside this this business. And when I was doing mobile phones in, in HP, that was like the big thing was, hey, we're going to get back into mobile and do all these things. And it's like it, there's definitely truth in that, right? And certainly, you know, senior managers can look and see groups that are gelling and vibing and really, you know, producing. Um, but it's a big big difference from when you're actually on the, yeah. you know, <laughs> at the startup and actually doing it right. Or you're, you know, if you're like yourself and you're in consulting business, right. Your reputation with a customer, you know, is, is on the line every time. Well, and so, everybody talks in this industry too. So, I mean, if we do a bad job and, you know, I don't know, like customer X, you know, is like, Hey, SK ruined our product, you know, I mean, we'll never get out from under that. We have to do a good job for everyone because we're so small. You know, we wouldn't survive, you know, that kind of a reputation hit, you know. I mean, 
let alone, you know, you don't want to be the kind of person that does that kind of stuff. But I mean, just from a self-interest perspective, you know, that the reputational damage would be really difficult to recover from. Yeah, for sure. So um, what do you want to work on that you haven't had a chance to work on yet? And I guess I, I'll kind of hamper that with another question, which is what are some of the things you worked on, you know, sort of before your professional life that, that put you in the direction of mobile phones and robots and, and just wanting to be into cool tech? I mean, I was, you know, I think maybe I was five and uh, my parents threw away a, a electric can opener and I fished it out of the trash and, you know, tore it apart, figured out what it was. And, you know, there was a, there was a gear that had fallen out of place. I put it back together and, you know, plugged it in, electrocuted myself while I did that. Nice. It worked, <laughs> you know, and I think it's for some folks, it's kind of in you, you know, it's just like, um, I really got into computers, uh, when I was young and just loved programming and the whole kind of nature of that. And I've just been super fortunate to work for a variety of companies that have done a bunch of cool things. Um, early on, I worked for a company called Remtron. They were a very small engineering group, um, that basically projects came in the door and it was like, okay, figure out how to um, uh, put a remote control on an overhead bridge crane at a steel mill. Or uh, I think we did the, um, we did uh, cameras for uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, we did uh, remote those, control. Those, were those those overhead wire ones or, or like a different thing? These are actually in the blimp. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. to, yeah, they wanted to control them from, uh, you know, like a control tower down in the in the stadium. And so it was a uh, uh, licensed wireless at the time. That's really and, cool. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, we even did uh, like a remote control lawnmower for the Department of Energy. We did, uh, you know, just a ton of stuff. Carving dinosaur, we put uh, remote controls on that. And so, you know, it was great to get a variety. I was the only software engineer there. So, you know, I wrote every line of code and it was a lot of eight bit embedded stuff and nice. you know, wireless and whatnot. And then um, I got a chance to, to go to Motorola and do, um, at the time, was their first uh, Qualcomm based phone. And so, you know, it was kind of a side project for them. I, I kind of figured out over time. Uh, but we ended up doing about 60 different, you know, mobile phones from before they were smart to after they were smart and lots of different uh, uh, platforms. We built lots of platforms kind of in the early days and there's still a lot of norming and storming going on in that industry and um, lots of early days of Linux and um, those kinds of things and Bluetooth technology and Wi-Fi when that was, you know, really kind of um, coming online, if you will. And then, of course, all the different wireless standards from CDMA to GSM to LTE and, and, you know, beyond. So that was all really cool and, you know, showed me how to do scale. And then by the time I left, you know, we had like 10 million phones under, you know, we were tracking. And so wow. um, that was really, you know, kind of early days of big data and data science and like, okay, how do you find commonalities and issues and, you know, serve those back to developers so they can make these connected products better and do, you know, over the air software. Like <laughs> now it's, it's very commonplace. Yeah. It's but, critical these yeah. days. I mean, you know, you'd be sort of a monkey not to put it in. <laughs> but, I would would say probably the first, you know, 40 products I did at Motorola though, there was no, you know, we're going to update the software afterwards. And so you learn a, you know, a certain rigor with that kind of thing, like whatever's in it is what it's going to be in it for the next, you know, X number of years. And, you, know, you see some of your products after years, you know, in the market, and people are still using it. It's like, hey, I almost forgot about that. <laughs> um, and even, you know, like Roomba and Brava bringing some of that scale there and helping, you know, make the newer products like the i3 and the J7. Um, and, you know, getting to learn like robotics really more so and, and learn, um, you know, mapping and, and localization and, and more different types of computer vision for classification and semantic maps and stuff like that. It's, um, it's been really cool 
Um, and I think there's a ton of new technology. I think robotics can be huge for a long time. I play around with the generative AI stuff now. I mean, that's, you know, that's a that's watershed moment. <laughs> Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to get our code and our documents into um, embedding so that we can, um, you know, leverage that from a developer perspective, maybe even from a support perspective, um, maybe even for new applications. So it's, um, you know, I think there's just been really a, a steady stream of cool new stuff. And I mean, if I look further off, my son is into physics and it's like, okay, how far away are quantum computers? Oh yeah, my my cousin was working on quantum computers for NIST. That stuff is so far beyond my comprehension as to how it actually works. I mean, I understand the basic principle, but that's about as far as my knowledge goes. So that's that's wild. Oh, yeah. What what is your son working on? Well, he's just starting his PhD now, cool. but uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know he's kind of opened my eyes to some of that stuff and just where you know, where the state of that technology is, is, uh, it's really exciting. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, the generative stuff is really, really interesting to see too. Cause I mean, I don't know, like all of us saw like when, when chat GPT and Dolly and all that came online and there's a super impressive public facing demo that I think opened a lot of people's eyes, you know, including mine to, you know, all the stuff's real. (laughs) Oh Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, as kind of a big open source advocate is, is how much like the open source has embraced it and kind of gone off in multiple directions. You get things oh, like... that's been interesting to track. Yeah, the baby AGI and Bakuna and, you know, all these different chat agents and whatnot that are out there. And it's like, you know, once again, I think you see how, um, you yeah, know, things can be applied so quickly and lots and lots of different things can be um, collaboratively kind of explored yeah. and it makes a commercial space for for things uh, to follow. How long do you think it's going to be before, and I, I hate to put you with this kind of question, so if you don't want to answer it, you don't have to, but just speculatively, like how long do you think it's going to be before we start seeing like, you know, that sort of, you know, conversational model on like an embedded device, like something that's not connected to the internet. Cause I feel like we're getting close, especially with some of the open source stuff. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. There's been huge progress ever. I mean, over the last, it's only been a couple of months really. Yeah. Uh, since chat GPT four came out, which I think was really the one that opened so many people's eyes. And, um, you know, it's the, it's the llama model that uh, kind of got leaked from from meta that's the one that, i've been thinking of the most <laughs> yeah you know is is those in the what is it chat gpt j are the ones you know the the four bit um quantization really seems to be driving it down to smaller and smaller footprints so I've been following I be that. yeah is that, is that just trying to compress you know like the amount of math you have to do by going to four bit yeah well i th- think and you know a lot of this is secondhand for me but um i think a lot of it it found ways to kind of optimize the the training of the models and use a lot less memory uh in so doing and so you know what comes to mind for me is yeah you're able to run those in you know embedded devices moving forward right and you'll have conversational ai at least you know simple stuff uh possible in tons of different applications and i would think it would be you know the way it's moving it looks like you know you're ready for products within a year yeah uh, it seems like like my understanding as well that's that's wild (laughs) it is wild you know but that's part of why i love the space too is you know when i first started at motorola um and this was long before smartphones i had a friend of mine say hey you know that whole space is really built out. Um, That was in 1999. And I said, really go someplace else, you know, do something new. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, luckily I saw it a little different than he did. Um, But uh, I I kind of feel that way still, that there's just a ton of um, innovation on the horizon. Oh yeah, for sure. What's that old adage? And I've brought this up on the podcast before. So if you're a listener, I'm sorry if I've 
spilled this one, but I think in like the early 1900s, they wanted to close the patent office because everything had already been invented. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so luckily they didn't. And, you know, yeah. and I don't know, I've not patented anything yet. And I, I don't know that I want to, but even still, you know, I'm glad people are still inventing things. And, um, you know, I mean, it's obviously we've got a lot more technology than we had in, you know, 1910 or whenever that was. <laughs> And obviously, smartphones yeah, have come a long way since 1999. I mean, that that would have been pre-iPhone, right? So. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was like 2005, I think, ish. But I could be wrong on that. Well, and I think you know part of it is too, though. Like with the proliferation of smartphones, a lot of components and a lot of ecosystems built up. So it wasn't just the software, but it was also the hardware you know, that got better, faster, cheaper. And so then those things like gyroscopes can be used and sensors can be used in lots of other things, cameras, right, can all be used in robotics that then, you know, serve as building blocks for kind of this evolution. And so, you know, that's why I think, you know, you kind of continue to see this, it ebbs and flows from time to time, but, you know, it's kind of like it continues to build on you know, the progress that's been made and things that, you know, like robotics that have been around for a long time in factories now can go into fast food restaurants. Yeah, which is awesome. I mean, we've, as roboticists, have been benefiting from, like, the smartphone community, like, pretty substantially over the last, you know, I, I would think, like, 20 years or so. I mean, just like you mentioned, you know, you know, IMUs, uh, GPS... Uh, the camera systems, I mean, you know, now development of things like stereo cameras for robotics. I mean, I think Apple sells their iPhones with LiDAR now. I'm sure Google's doing something similar that I just haven't looked into as much. And it, it, it's pretty wild just to see all those sensor prices got getting, you know, kind of driven down. Um, one of our first customers was using, um, you know, Google phones um, as, you know, system computers and their robots because it was just cheaper than anything you could get like eight years ago whenever they were doing that and um at the time i mean it was pretty easy to, to hack them for that use case so you know i mean and yeah you know i i think it's amazing that the tech that's been developed i mean when you look at you know unitree making that robot dog for like you know a retail price point of seven or eight grand i mean it's incredible that they've managed to fit all that tech you know, into, you know, that, I mean, if you look at the Amazon Astro, you know, that, that's another example of like, what, what is that? Like the $1,500 for early adopters, like 2k. But then when you look at the amount of tech that's, that's strapped onto it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, they've got to be selling those at a slight loss or at the very least not making a ton of money, just given how many sensors that thing has on it and the amount of compute and capability and actuation. Even things like Roomba, though, um, help drive down those types of things, right? Because sure. you've got you've got similar phenomena that happen with actuators, and although they're quite simple, right? I think is you know the applications you find those profitable niches and they grow, then they kind of you know they help drive down the the kind of unit economics of you know doing similar types of things. That's awesome. How many Roombas, yeah. like approximately, like has iRobot sold at this point? Like it's got to be well, in the tens of millions by now. While I was there, um, I ran you know both the new product development, but also the maintenance of the existing units, and we had five million oh, units wow. that were connecting in each month. And so you know it was like, hey, this feels like a real opportunity, you know, like a big data opportunity for us to learn from our own products in a way that, you know, very few other companies can. And, you know, let's go really focus on trying to make those better and then also use, feed that into um, our new products. And so, you know, we substantially increased the investment behind the, the data science nice. at the company to kind of analyze the fleet and then, you know, figure out, okay, what do we need to build next? And, you know, that was a J7. It became really obvious. You need to move the camera from the top to the front so that you can, you know, see the things that are out in front of it and stop getting stuck on them. Because before that, it was, you know, try to get unstuck from this unknown item. 
So you just had to dead reckon and rock back and forth and revert to, you know, sort of the early Roomba like behavior of, you know, random number generators and <laughs> fumbling escape. around. Yeah, escape behaviors is what we call them. But the, so like the J, what was it? The I7, I think, had a camera that pointed the ceiling. And, you know, one of, I think they bought a, a, a startup. Uh, evolution robotics that had learned how to do slam but huh. they were doing and primarily through um you know pointing the camera at like the ceiling because the ceiling didn't change or move much right there wasn't as many obstacles that's to, interesting you know, in the way, right and by you know several years later it, after slam is you know a little more commonplace then it's like okay while well, putting the camera in the front you've got the ability to stabilize the image better um, you also have the ability to recognize obstacles and ignore them so that, you know, you didn't understand like which items have permanence and which items are, you know, temporary. Um, and yeah, you can do a lot more with it. And so, you know, even like that type of technology, right. And the, it's very similar to what the autonomous cars are doing now, you know, with learning by getting out there on the road. That's the, that's a crazy problem space though. Those guys have, solve so many interesting problems and, and have just a litany of challenges in front of them. I mean, that is, I, I have so much respect for, for everyone working on self-driving because it is, it is complicated out there on, in the real world <laughs> with, with pedestrians. <laughs> yeah. It's much easier being a Roomba and you've got a bumper on there that you can just, uh, you know, kind of bump into something and realize, yep, nope, that's a real thing. As opposed to, you know, two tons of steel at, you know, 70 miles an hour or whatever. <laughs> yes. Much harder problem. Yeah, for sure. Now, I, I have I have a lot of friends in that industry, and, and some of the stuff that they tell me keeps them up at night. You know, like, for instance, um, one of my buddies at one of the self-driving car companies brought up, you know, you see an object in front of you on the road. How do you know if that's a baby or, like, a garbage bag, you know? <laughs> like a grocery bag just blowing across the road like a tumbleweed you know it's it's you know it's kind of intuitively easy for a human but i mean when you've yeah. got you know i mean i don't know from a point cloud perspective those look pretty similar so there's there's some weird edge cases those guys are getting hung up on that are kind of interesting and it's really hard right yeah. i mean even if the system is you know better than a human what's the decision-making process for dealing with, you know, those kinds of things and who wants to be the one, you know, to make that decision. It's a hard one to make. Yeah, for sure. When I also feel like your tolerance for error is lower, like if you're, you know, a human driver and you screw up, I mean, you know, that's kind of nothing new and yes, it's a tragedy and it sucks and people are upset, but if you're a self-driving car company and you screw up, you know, the whole tech, you know, it's, 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 it's the entire team's fault. And it's, it seems like it's, there's a lot lower of a margin for forgiveness there. So it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, place that people are at. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, you know, you look at other applications that are out there and I think this is why it'd probably be a long tail for the autonomous car companies, but for, you know, lots of other applications that are a little more forgiving, you know, there's just great space out there. And they're kind of benefiting from some of those technologies too. You For know, sure. At iRobot, we put a, a huge uh, simulation program in place so that, you know, we had one code base and six different products that came off of it. And so you know, it was really hard for a software developer to learn, you know, was a change that they made going to impact any one of the six products in hundreds of homes or different scenarios that it could be in. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we set up simulation, which is helpful, which is certainly a place where a lot of the autonomous car companies have invested a, a bunch and have also, you know, uh, contributed a lot. And, uh, you know, even still, like, you know, we get some of the ancillary benefits from GPU acceleration and things like that that make, you know, simulation more efficient and more, you know, really impactful for development. And so early on, we were developing Flippy. We've got simulations of Flippy and a simulation for each of the environments that it's in. Oh, cool. So you can test things here internally 
um, you know, in simulation before we test them in hardware, you know, before we test them in the customer. Before you so, make 500 tacos in the lab. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are you using so, um, like the ROS based simulation tools um, or what do you, you use? You use Gazebo. Nice. Yeah. Uh, we've tried a few of the others as well. The Isaac Sim has come in a long way. Um, and uh, we've used others for selected kind of purposes. Um, but uh, yeah, Gazebo is really easy to get into and it's got, you know, a lot of folks that can that can work on that. So um, that's been the primary one for us. That's awesome. Yeah. I think, I think we've done some stuff with open rave and gazebo, but um, not my, not my direct function, but it's, it's been neat to see how quickly people can get stuff running in some of those platforms. Yeah. And I think as it, you know, as those technologies come online, it, uh, it makes it easier to develop some of the more sophisticated applications and, you know, as we think of what our next, you know, Flippy's going to look like, there's a lot of simulation goes into it before we start building hardware because it's a lot cheaper, for one, and you can iterate a lot faster, right? And that was the thing that at iRobot we learned was really what it did was it got rid of a lot of kind of basic issues. And then when we were doing the hardware-driven testing, um, we could, you know, be a little more uh, harsh on it and we could focus more on what the hardware based, you know, uh, issues were as opposed to just like generic logic bugs, maybe the simulation could find. That makes a lot um, of sense. Yeah. And you can sort of determine your kinematic. Well, I guess if you're using an off the shelf arm, it's sort of given to you, but you can see sort of, you know, like what the limitations of a certain arm in a certain environment are. Um, but then, yeah, like you said, hardware issue. What are some of the hardware issues you guys have faced down um, and, and kind of overcome? Uh, just because I'd be curious as, as more of a hardware guy. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the issues we had was with uh, our hopper. Um, our, our partner, uh, Taylor, had created a control board for us. And basically, you know, this is a product that kind of exists in kitchen, commercial kitchens already. It just has a button on it and you press the button and it dispenses, you know, like a small, medium or large portion of food. And so, you know, it seemed quite straightforward. Hey, here's a, a small embedded board and Flippy will request, you know, a small, medium or large portion of food. Well, that worked, you know, 99 out of 100 times, but one out of 100 times it didn't work. And so what would happen is sometimes it would go early and sometimes huh. it wouldn't go at all. Interesting. And, you know, initially we weren't necessarily checking for that because, well, hey, it was super reliable in our testing. Yes, but, you know, when you start cooking 10,000 baskets of food a week <laughs> and you're missing, you know, 100 baskets of food, it's like, okay, what's going on here, right? And so we ended up having to um, pipe the sen some sensors that had a scale, you know, it's like we weren't reading necessarily the scale weights and so we basically put a like a controls um you know state machine into flippy to manage the hopper and to verify you know a bunch of things that before was just like push the button um, oh, that's interesting so are you using like a load cell um not a load sorry a force torque sensor in the wrist to do that that sensing or verification you were right the first time so right now we have a Thanks. load cell on on uh a scale in the hopper that tells you how much food is dispensed to verify that it actually got the right amount of food also helps us tell when it's empty. Where does that so, live on the hopper? Just out of curiosity. Is that like, so the food, yeah, the food gets dispensed into kind of like a holding area and that holding area has got a it. scale. So okay. Tells you, you know, what's the right amount of food dispensed because food is still, yeah, it's still variable. Um, and so, you know, we might say, oh, okay, it's not enough. It hasn't met the minimum threshold, dispense a little more, or it's more than expected. Okay, let's adjust uh, like a cook time or something. And if someone gets an extra yeah. chicken tender, they're probably not going to complain. So, yeah. yeah. But you're right on the other part as well. So, that's another thing that we're working with is, yeah, measuring the torques on the, the, the joints to also kind of, um, you know, confirm sensor weights. And, you know, it's a way for us to 
kind of jointly or not jointly, but um, kind of compare and confirm uh, sensor readings. That way, you know, you, you've kind of got some redundancy built into some of the applications. That's, that's really cool. And it makes sense. I mean, it, it you know, if you're only seeing that one out of a hundred times, um, I could see how you might dismiss it or not even see it in your simulation because maybe the simulation just doesn't model for that, that failure mode. And so, you know, when you start seeing that, yeah, it's, Hey, did I get it or not? Yes. Okay. You know, if no, oh, ask for it again, you know, so that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. Well, and we were cooking ghost basket of foods. So, you know, I thought it got the food and then it cooks it and then it dumps it and there's nothing there, you know, and they're like, what's it doing? <laughs> what is, what is mine? Yeah, it makes okay. sense. Uh, that's a use case that, you know, on a number of different levels, and then, you know, we started to build in some redundancy to, to check it. Do you know what the, I guess it doesn't matter what the failure mode is, the way you're handling it, but I, I was kind of curious if, if you knew kind of what was causing that, that misfire. Yeah, there were some timing issues depending on, you know, when you would press, you know, when it would send the, the button press, uh, there were a few operations going on in the hopper that if it was doing one of those at the time, you know, it might ignore the, the signal. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That's really interesting. Yeah, I guess you need that state machine then at that point because it sounds like the Flippy's perception just doesn't always have, you know, monitoring of everything the hopper is doing. And, right. I mean, yeah. computer vision is great, but you still, you know, has limitations and it's like, okay, we're going to check each basket for food. Well, if you stop in front of the camera and check each basket as, you know, it's going, then sure you can reclassify the food and make sure it's you know as expected but then that adds a few extra seconds to each of the baskets you're processing brutal right <laughs> so now you've got your efficiency that you know it's like okay well, what's the most efficient way to do this so that you know we can be you know producing as much food as possible with as few defects as possible yeah that makes sense the load cells right there you would have had it in that holding area anyway so if you're weighing it, you know, that takes milliseconds, you know, great. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I had another yeah, I mean, one. Oh, sorry, after you. But, I mean, it's really, it's a big integration issue, right? Like you're just, we're integrating lots of different tech. There's dozens of, of packages in the software, and different pieces of hardware that are coming together. And, you, you know, over time, you're learning the limitations of all of those different systems. And then, you know, you always have the added where we're interfacing with people. And so, you know, like the first restaurant, it took us several months and we, we became very kind of effective and efficient there and we're ready to go. And we go to, you know, some new restaurants. It's like, wait a second, what? We're having all these similar but different problems. What's going on? <laughs> well, they, they're just using the product slightly differently. And, you know, they have different expectations on it as well. And so, you know, then after we're at like five or six different restaurants, we start to see, you know, trends and normalizing. And it's like, okay, our user interface is getting a little more intuitive. Uh, we're handling more of the error cases. And so, you know, now you're kind of getting real market fit as opposed to just basically, you know, training to a single store set. That's awesome. Do you find you end up pushing uh, UI elements from those like next customers back to the first customer? And do you have that? Absolutely. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there's a little bit of art in there for sure. Yeah. It's a you UI. <laughs> what do people, you know, what's a, yeah. What, what resonates with people, right. And is it different in different places? And that's kind of what yeah, I was wondering I'm, is like, is it unique to the customers so much or is it more, like they just didn't know what to ask for over there and they got used to it. And then you realize with these guys, oh, we could make it better because we're seeing this adoption issue or, or something. Mostly at this point, it, it's kind of going across the fleet, but I could definitely see, you know, like regional variants. Um, we are in foreign countries, so we do have, uh, you know, multiple languages that we cool. need to support as well. But we really try and stay away from that and go to just iconography that's, you know, as obvious as possible. That's the ideal if you can do it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's really yeah. cool. 
I was going to ask, it's a kind of a dumb low level question, but I, I'm just, it's, it's been sort of eating at me. How do you guys keep grease off the lenses on your camera systems? It's actually a pretty good question because, um, all of our cameras are actually up in the, the, basically the, the top of the frame, if you will. So we don't put any of them down by the fryers or on the end effector because yeah, the, the end effector does get, you know, grease and food particulate on it. And so, um, wouldn't really be a good place for a camera. Nice. And so, yeah, we just, we have multiple cameras in there and we have some overlap in them so that, you know, as a robot's doing its thing, generally one of the cameras can see, you know, where it's at, what it's doing. That's really cool. Yeah. That's, that's a good solution. Yeah. Uh, well, I won't take credit for that one, but, uh, <laughs> it, it seems to work well. I've seen a bunch of different ways to handle that problem. So when I worked in mining, um, we would blow compressed air through an aperture that, you know, sat uh, in front of the cameras. So you could sort of keep dust out that way. Um, I think we had a patent at Joy on um, an aperture that would close when the camera wasn't taking readings and then open up to keep rocks off the camera. Um, my understanding, although I didn't ever get a close look at it, is that Caterpillar had... Um, sort of a licensing agreement with Velodyne. So they were able to redesign their 64 line sensor um, and include some hardening against rocks and debris in the redesign when they, when they relicensed it, it was kind of an interesting deal. Um, at the time it was blocking us from using those sensors at joy too, which I thought was a clever move on cat's part. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So I, I'm sorry, I kind of nerd out over that stuff and, I no, like there's, I mean, there's interesting stuff too. You see with like nitrogen pressurization and sometimes when you look in those pressurized electronics bays, it's, it's really neat because I, I have a laser cutter. I run that's got um, just a compressed air pressurized electronics bay. And whenever I open it up to work on it, it's, it's like as clean as the day, you know, it came off the line because it's, you know, there's no dust ingress because it's pressurized every time it runs. So kind that's of, kind very of neat. Cool. Yeah. I don't know. I just nerd out over stuff like that. <laughs> I mean, at some point, you know, that becomes a bit of it, too, is, is there's so much technology out there and so many different ways to solve some of these problems. With, you know, it's hard to find folks that have an infinite skill set. Of, it doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> all the different ways. And certainly, you know, I think that's, you know, one of the benefits of the marketplace is that, you know, if there is a better way out there, someone will find it. But, uh, you know, sometimes I think, too, with robotics, it, it seems easier than it is. And there's a lot of folks that get into it and because they can make something work. But, you know, can you make it robust and repeatable and reliable is, you know, a much different story. And, you know, I think that's where, you know, as an industry, we're still in that chaotic phase. Yeah, well, but, I, that's, uh, that seems to be a common theme between you and Florian, and I think a worthwhile one is like looking at captured data in the field and using that to harden your core product. I mean, that's, you know, that's huge. <laughs> it's the only way we're going to mature as an industry. I mean, I think so. Yeah. It's kind of like the Omaha beach for robotics companies, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, I've got this really interesting product. Okay. And then, you know, it's like, it doesn't ever get to that point where, yeah, you know, it's ubiquitous. Um, but uh, it's coming, right? And we see more and more applications out there. They'll get there. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Roomba is like one of the highest selling robots of all time, if not the highest. And, and you got to work on that. So that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, that was really cool. And then, you know, they're just, they're so foundational. And uh, the number of companies that have spun off, you know, that are kind of like things that they were in for a while. And then they, you know, moved on to the next one. And it's like hospital robotics and, a lot of the military applications and yeah, you know, and even some of the founders have gone on to, to found a number of other new companies. It's like, uh, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, I, I think a lot of what it comes down to is it's, it's just such a small, um, group of folks that are sort of wired like you and me that are interested in this stuff. And I mean, it's, it's definitely measured like in the single digit thousands. I could be wrong. Maybe it's more than that. But you know, just going to trade conventions and talking to people and everybody seems to know everybody and it's really not that many roboticists in the world right now. And so, 
it kind of makes sense that like, you know, a big portion of them would get pulled into like one of the biggest robotics companies that's ever existed, you know, and work for iRobot and then go off and do all this awesome other robotic stuff. They're not going to stop making robots. You know? <laughs> so. yeah. yeah. And I think it was like, I've been to a few of the robotics conferences and I was surprised by the number of people that were like, yeah, I worked at iRobot. And, uh, you know, I even met with uh, Martin Bueller, and he was, um, you know, he had been at Boston Dynamics and at iRobot. And um, I think he's at Johnson & Johnson now. He, he is. Yeah, he just took over their surgical uh, robot division, I think. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, just hearing kind of all the different experiences there is, you know, like the industry has been kind of gestating for a number of years. And I think as more of the technologies kind of come together, then... You know, it makes more of the applications have a, you know, good positive ROI and be, you know, buildable and sustainable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I really like the Omaha Beach analogy, too. Like, I feel like that that applies to a lot of different types of industries, not just robotics. (laughs) It's really just like uh, the startup landscape in general. (laughs) I think it's the Robo Report that puts out their annual, you know, robotics companies we lost this year Ah, oh, brutal yeah. and it's yeah i mean it's amazing the number of companies that are in it year in and year out you know and is it's that like, like an oitzman or <laughs> what's that is that a mike oitzman publication that one or i know he's I'm an editor sure. for yeah <laughs> yeah but cool. you know it's good to like kind of look at it and think oh yeah i remember those guys you know it's like oh, i remember what they were doing it's like hmm, i wonder what you know, what was the missing ingredient? I think right now there's still, you know, there's still a lot of things that kind of separate um, the successful companies from those that are able to, you know, that that aren't able to get there. Yeah. But well, I the, feel the like gaps are closing. Absolutely. And there's another interesting thing I've noticed, which is I feel like oftentimes like a, an unsuccessful first mover will sort of make a path for a successful second mover. So um, one of the things that, Tony Fidel talks about in that book, Build, that I was kind of, you know, plugging earlier. Uh, Tony, if you're listening. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Anyway, um, I'd love to have you as a podcast guest. (laughs) There you uh, go. Yeah. Um, Anyway, um, so they they talk about like quantitative decisions versus, you know, intuitive decisions. And like early on in a new idea where you don't have any product in the market, it's almost impossible to make quality. Uh, quantitative decisions because there's no data to to make them based off of yet. And so I, yeah. I'm thinking of like rethink robotics and like universal robots, like in particular, right. for an example, um, you know, rethink had the Baxter and the Sawyer and the Sawyer was kind of closer to the mark, but, you know, still had that, um, you know, flat screen that it didn't really need to have that ate up cost. And I think it was like a sonar array that it was running, which was, you know, sort of older tech and didn't necessarily need to be there where like you are focused on, I think they used like torque feedback based on current consumption. And so they were able to get, you know, not as fast as like a Yaskawa arm or something, but you know, faster right. than any of the cobots that were at market, you know, at that point. And so it was kind of amazing how much market share those guys were able to take by sort of standing on, you know, the, the shoulders of, of falling companies and, and using some of the yeah. lessons learned to, to build a more successful product. So. Well, and you've got Rodney Brooks, right? He was, a, I think one of the founders there, you think, and he was also one of the founders at iRobot. So yeah, you know, luckily some of those folks were able to contribute in multiple companies, you know? Yeah, for sure. Is there anything you want to talk about or plug or kind of, you know, come back to on the way out? Well, I mean, I think one, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming uh, and on. Thanks, and thanks for what you do. You know, I think building the, the ecosystems and talking about it is, is helpful for everyone. Uh, I certainly enjoy it. And, um, you know, I think, um, yeah, no, I, I think this was a good conversation. And, uh, you know, certainly uh, lots of good folks out there that I hope you get to talk to in robotics and keep doing doing that. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Chris. No, I mean, I, yeah. I, I learn a lot from doing this and I get to talk to awesome folks like yourself. And I kind of say, you know, it's it's pretty much a guaranteed intellectual conversation every week, which, 
you know, it's, I look forward to these a lot. So I appreciate that. Right on. Um, and you know, I mean, I, uh, I, I really enjoyed hearing about kind of you and your journey with flippy and some of the other things you've worked on before that. So, uh, you know, I, I, I really appreciate you coming on. It's my pleasure. All right. Thanks a lot, Spencer. Thanks for coming on, Chris. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.